Aloha and welcome to today's session, Reality Check, What to Expect in Graduate School. My name is Kristen Connors, and I am the Fellowship, Scholarships, and Professional Development Coordinator in Graduate Division. I'll also be moderating today's session. In today's session, you will hear what the first year of graduate school might look like and learn tips for a successful start. At the end of the presentation, we'll have time for open questions and answers, so please take notes throughout the presentation. With that said, I would like to turn things over to our presenter for today, Dr. Yoshimi Rii. Dr. Rii? Thanks, Kristen. Can you guys all hear me? Okay. Um, aloha, everybody. I'm Shimi Rii, and I'm currently a specialist faculty member at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology serving as the research coordinator for the Heia National Estuarine Research Reserve. Um, I am a graduate of the UH Manoa graduate program. I got my master's in 2006 and my doctorate in 2016. I was um, one of those people who did not have a straightforward path through grad school. I worked before and between my two graduate degrees and I gained a lot of insights from both of those times I spent as a graduate student. So hopefully I can provide some tips that will help you as you uh, start your path in grad school. Okay. So before I start, I would like to offer up this land acknowledgement, recognizing Hawaii as a place where the deep indigenous knowledge systems of native Hawaiians are continually under threat of institutional racism and colonization. Even today, 128 years after the illegal overthrow of the Hawaiian kingdom. Here at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, physically located in the Ahupua'a of Waikiki, in the Moku of Kona, on the Moku Puni of Oahu, I am grateful and privileged for the opportunity to honor those who came before us and those who strive to restore the abundance and prosperity of the Aina to sustain meaningful connections amongst us. Thank you. Okay, so throughout my presentation, I want you guys to keep this saying in mind. This is a Hawaiian um, mo'olelo or olelo noia or saying, um, so not all knowledge is taught in one school. And that I think to me embodies graduate school. You are going to learn so much from so many different areas and you're gonna to have to forge many of that um, on your own, you may you are going to have to forge that path and find these different schools yourself. So please keep that in mind as I go through my talk. Okay, so many of you are probably in these spaces right now, with many paths leading to where you're standing and many paths leading forward. So some of you are might might be coming straight from undergrad. Um, or you did something else in between, or you had an entirely different career and you're coming back to school. So whatever it is, you thought a whole lot about your next steps in life and you decided to make this decision to seek this higher degree, right? So in the origins of advanced degrees, like a master's or a doctorate, um, it was considered to be like a training or a form of apprenticeship or guild when you actually seek a higher degree. So the word doctorate actually comes from the Latin root doceo, which is, um, means I teach. So you are actually now entering training to be able to have exclusive qualification to teach your subject. That was, a, that was how it was in the old days. So basically grad school, you know, think of it, grad school as kind of like, you know, don't think of it as an extension of school or undergrad, or you're just gonna go to classes and you know, get grades. It's actually kind of a job right, where you are training to be a professional or expert in your field. But when you think a job, you think, okay, people are going to wear suits and people are going to be like, where, you know, going to be on computers and, you know, be in nice air conditioned rooms. That's probably not what grad school is going to look like, right? It's, you're probably going to look more like this, where you're studying with a lot of books and sleeping at weird times of the day. You're going to be in the lab a lot if you're in the sciences. You're going to be teaching a lot, you know, et cetera. Um, but even though for each of you, grad school might look very different, grad school is actually a job. That's how, that's how I view it, right? Um, because you're training to be a professional in your field. So, okay, um, e either way, whether, you know, whether it's an extension of school or, or it's a job, you know, like you're like, okay, you know, thinking, oh, it's, you know, Shimi's telling me it's, it's a job, but what does it mean, right? 
It's a job with low to no pay. <laughs> you work 60 to 80 hours a week. Your progress is not really measured by promotions. And while you have a boss, you pretty much manage yourself. So basically, you're going to need to have these desirable qualifications. You're going to need self-sufficiency. You're going to need incredible organizational skills, interpersonal communication skills, and flexibility um, because things are going to be changing. And as you guys are starting out, think about maybe what your resume looks like right now. Maybe some of you have really, really detailed resumes already, and some of you are just coming off undergrad and you know, you're know you starting to build your resume. But what kind of skills you would like to gain towards the end of your graduate school? And it could even help to fill out something like an individual development plan or IDP. And if you've never heard of this, you know you should ask your um, department, you know, your advisor, because I know that a lot of um, departments in UH through grad division um, are trying to implement the individual development plans, where you have these different circles or aspects of your individual development, and you could work on, let's say you want to work on um, leadership, or you want to work on communication, then you actually make these goals that you can work on with your advisor or your mentor to, to gain these skills by the end of your graduate school. Okay, and I just wanna get this out of the way. This is a book called 57 Ways to Screw Up in Grad School. Basically, you're gonna do everything and you're, it's gonna, you cannot screw up grad school. I mean, like you will screw up grad school in that everything you do might be listed in this book, right? You could have co-supervisors, you could um, attend too many conferences, you know, you could do an unfunded PhD, you could uh, be alone and you could, you know, have, um, expect to write the perfect comprehensive. like you're going to have all these expectations and all these things but basically this book and all these blogs and experiences are going to tell you that you're going to have various paths and various ways and there's no one correct way to do grad school so think about that and just go into it with that expectation that everyone you're going to forge your own path okay so before I go any further um, I want to kind of just get a temperature of the room. I know you guys answered um, maybe some uh, survey questions, but I wanna um, get a sense of what this room is like today and what you wanna hear about today. Okay, so you should be seeing a poll on your screen and we'll just give you a few seconds to click on your answers. It is multiple choice, so go ahead, click as many responses that seem applicable to you. Okay, let's we have 92% participation. Let me go ahead and share the results with everyone. And you okay. should be seeing it on your screen. Well, great. This is actually really interesting because last year, I think a lot of people were really um, nervous about COVID adjustments. But I think everyone has maybe adjusted to this, you know, hybrid, Zoom, synchronous, non-synchronous lifestyle um, in, in all aspects of your life. And you guys are, you know, graduate school and personal life balance, doing well in classes, time management. Okay, so um, thank you. Um, thank you, Kristen, for administering that. I'm gonna aim to touch upon many of these topics today, not in any particular order. And I'm gonna try to avoid a laundry list of things you have to do or what I should have known, um, but more of a discussion of what worked for me and many of my peers. Okay, so step one, this is kind of the nitty gritty of like assembling your training materials and guide, right? Then I'm gonna go through each of these um, in more in detail, but you're, most of you are gonna take classes the first year. And then I want you guys to think about creating your learning community, which will happen kind of organically, but you can also seek it out. And then you're all going to start your research or your thesis or your capstone or, or something like that. So let's dive into it. So your classes, right? Um, professors. So this is really different from, you know, having your professors in undergrad where you just take your class and then, you know, you get your grade and then um, that's it. Your professors are going to be really important. They're going to be your future mentors. They're going to be your committee members. You might go to them for career advice. You might go to them for letter writers if you apply for fellowships and etc. So it's really important to actually identify professors of different um, different fields, not just ones in your field, but people you can identify with that followed similar paths or that, that you actually just simply like as a person and then seek their advice for career in academia or you know, after graduate school. So build relationships with your professors. 
Okay, so studying methods, it's not your first rodeo, right? All of you have gone through undergrad to get here. So you guys already know if you're a morning person, night person, if you need coffee, um, if you only drink tea, you know, you need a quiet like library kind of setting or you need to be like um, in, in setting more in a group or you need visual or notes or et cetera. So, so really hone this, right? Um, make sure you, you take the tips that you needed and that, that you've already honed during your undergrad and then refine it because in a graduate school, you're going to be reading and reading and reading a lot. You're going to be doing a lot more work than you really thought you did in undergrad. And then, so then, you know, it's all about big picture and concepts. It's not so much about memorization. You know, your test in graduate school isn't really going to be um, like multiple choice, um, you know, those big like life sciences classes like that. It's really setting the foundation again to train you as an expert in your field. So you're gonna graduate and you're gonna go out and you're gonna be able to speak coherently uh, about the topic that you researched. So you want to try to get a good understanding of big picture concepts. And then grades do matter. Even though I just said this and it's all about building relationships, like you do want to get A's, which is not, you know, if you do all the work and, and you know, um, um, have good relationships, it shouldn't be that hard because um, you want to uh, be eligible for scholarships and fellowships and, and all the things that you might, you know, use to advance your career. So, so think about how um, it, it's different in graduate school because it's not about um, doing the multiple choice and getting the grades. So here you can actually look up old tests and, you know, work with other students to try to come up with um, um, short answers and, and things like that. And then I think, you know, right now with COVID, you know, maybe many of the tests might be, you know, take home and et cetera. So look up videos, recording, tutoring, and, and things like that. Um, finally, online classes. I think you guys are all really familiar with Zoom and online classes now. So, you know, of course, participate, ask questions. Don't try to do things in the background, which I'm totally guilty of. I try to like check my email and get things done. But then you end up like, why did you even sign on, right? Like, what was the whole point of even going to the class? So, you know, try to participate and be present in the online classes. Okay, I have another poll, and this is a short one. Did you have a learning community during undergrad or previously? Okay, looks like almost everyone participated. I'll go ahead and close the poll and share the results. Oh, this is great. So 34% said yes, which is a lot more than I thought. 22% um, no, and then somewhat, uh, some people were somewhat and unsure. Okay, great, thank you. So a learning community, in my opinion, and, and, you know, maybe some people would differ, but it's basically just having your, your tribe, your hood, right, that, um, that, that provides understanding, your safe place, etc. And, you know, it can be peer mentoring. So people who are other grad students, it could be committee members um, who are actually professors, it could be people in completely other departments that have passions, same passions as you. Maybe you guys are all passionate about science communication, or maybe you guys are all passionate about, um, you know, other other aspects um, at work, um, you know, other other efforts at at UH Manoa, or you know, other things like that. So basically, there, you know, now especially during COVID, you know, you might meet people online. So it, they can be virtual, you know, but maybe try to try to reach out to people and do co working sessions or you know, come up with uh, crazy research ideas and commiserate, ask for help on field work or ask for help on how to do things in your first year, because you probably have a lot of questions about, you know, how to um, be a grad student in Hawaii. So um, this is an article that I ended up writing um, when I was doing some science communication. And one of my passions is, was science communication. I ended up writing about why peer mentoring was so important. And these pictured here are actually my office mates. And we were all at different stages in our, our, our PhD, but we all commiserated um, about um, qualifying exams and professors and, and, and different things and different life stages. And as we, you know, I was in grad school for a long time. So, you know, my 
my problems or my issues at the beginning of grad school changed as we all kind of grew older. Some of us got married, you know, we started having families and things like that, looking for jobs. So I think, you know, your learning community can change and you can all grow together. So your learning community, in, you know, in addition to peers can also contain mentors. So start collecting mentors now. And I can't stress this enough, get lots and lots of mentors that, you know, I already said this, like identify people um, for me, it was really, really important to get female mentors who are either local or people of color or, you know, um, especially in, in Hawaii, you know, I was in oceanography. So a lot of my mentors were, you know, um, Caucasian men and not, you know, they provided lots of mentorship as well. But I also identified with, you know, people who were starting a family, people who were female um, navigating this lifestyle as well. Okay, third poll, uh, do you have a research project identified? Okay, again, looks like most people have participated. I'll go ahead and close the poll and share the results. Oh, interesting. Okay, so 11% said yes, I know exactly what I'm gonna research. And then, but most of you said I have a few ideas or no idea. And this is actually really good. This is a good, good, great place to be in because that allows you flexibility and you know you are going to be i mean if you were given a project you know that you knew exactly what was going to do maybe you're not passionate about it right so okay so these are just kind of my um steps to starting your research project first of course meet with your advisor frequently right you don't have to even know what your research project is but start meeting with your advisor frequently um, this means like, you know, maybe in the beginning, you don't have that much to discuss, maybe, maybe make it biweekly. And it's, you know, it's really easy to do so now with, you know, Zoom and things like that. But advisors are really busy. So find what works for you too. Maybe you just need a 30 minute check in or a 20 minute check in. Um, maybe you do well, as you're starting a research project, you do a literature review and you annotate your results and then you talk about it. Um, Maybe you meet and do some field work to help out other students in your lab, or you help out um, other things that are going on in your project, you know, at, help out your advisor on something. Um, a lot of projects are using Slack. You can also um, contact, see if your lab group uses Slack. Um, also email reminders and recaps. Like there's, I've heard a lot of stories of people saying, oh, I had emailed my advisor, but I never heard back. So, you know, maybe they don't care, but that's so not, it right because once you get to advisor stage you get you, you're away from your computer and you have 100 emails and you know I never really understood that back then either but just just say hey you know I emailed you about this can you um, remember to get to this or you know use slack or, or other ways for communication and establish clear and open communication right from the get-go so that you don't have um you know, things, you, you know what the expectations are with each other. Um, try things out. So a lot of advisors expect when you're at the graduate student level to be pretty independent from the beginning, you know? So like when they say, try out this method, like try it out before reporting back, you know? And then if you have other questions, then you should maybe ask other lab mates or, you know, specific questions you can ask your advisor. I mean, depends on obviously your relationship with your advisor, but we try it first before reporting back. And then of course, deliverable set moving targets. You might say, hey, I'm gonna get you this annotated bibliography by Thursday. And then if let's say, you know, life happens and you don't get it done, right? And just communicate, you know what? I didn't get it done. I need a few more days. I'll get it to you by um, next Thursday. And they'll totally understand, right? And then ask for connections and resources um, because they might not know um, exactly what you need but say, hey, can you connect me with this? Or can you actually connect me with this resource? Because your advisor will not know all the answer. They will most likely not know all the answer. And despite what I just said about advisors and how you need to meet with them frequently, they don't have to be your best friend. Actually, it's probably better if they're not your best friend because you know, once you cross over into the really good friend zone, then you know, it, it gets a little bit, you know, maybe weird a little, you know? But make sure at the same time that you and advisor have a good working relationship, right? Where you can communicate to each other, you're open and honest with each other. And if you do actually come across a problem or you have a problem with other 
you know, something that happened, you can trust your advisor and that you can actually go to that person. And then of course, you need to start thinking about your committee because in graduate school, it's not just you and your advisor. You need, your committee is going to have a say in whether you graduate or not. And your committee is gonna be a mix of advocates and field experts. So you wanna get someone who is going to provide different perspectives on your research, um, maybe even from other departments. Um, if you are doing interdisciplinary work, then you wanna make sure that those um, disciplines are well re uh, represented in your committee. Okay, so remember, try it, but document everything. So this is where you're starting this like, you know, <laughs> exploratory stage of research where you might try something and then you're like, ah, it didn't work. So I'm going to try something else. But you might forget, oh, I tried this three months ago, but I don't remember what I did. So take really, really good notes, whether it's going to be your lab notebook or this you know, software, a lot of things, I use this um, note taking called Evernote because then you can actually search for things and you can find it. Um, maybe a good old lab notebook or just a regular notebook would do too. There's things called rocket book where you actually um, write on it and then you can take a picture and then it archives it for you. Maybe most of you are actually taking notes on iPads and things like that now too. But find out what works for you because you're gonna amass a lot of notes and then try to, um, start out by documenting it all and organizing it very well. And then of course, backup things. Um, you all UH students are, have access to Google Drive, use it, but then also backup your Google Drive onto somewhere else, maybe create another backup drive because you just never know, backup everything. Okay, so I mentioned lit review. I think many of you guys don't really know what research projects you're doing. so. Bibliography, I think, will apply to many different disciplines because if you're training to be an expert in your field, you're learning the language, right? You're going to be trying to gain fluency in this language that's specific to your field that not everyone's going to know about. So, which means lots of reading, whether that's academic publications, gray literature, you know, maybe some people are doing, you know, oral history reports, new PIPA, like Hawaiian newspaper, you know, maybe interviews, things like that. But annotate, annotate, annotate. You want to use like a, um, a bibliography software like EndNote or Mendeley or Zotera and then annotate your references. That is going to help you at the start of your research because you're going to go back. And once you get really into your research, you'll be so thankful that you did because you'll forget that, you know, blank at all meant this. And then if you already have it annotated, that's going to be great. Um, create an overall timeline. So this is going to be time management. And of course, this is a huge, huge topic. Many of you guys talked about this, right? Um, you're not going to, so this is called a Gantt chart. And this is actually really, really um, good practice for those of you who are considering, you know, a career in um, project management or, you know, academia where you have to write grants or in any career, actually, you know, Gantt, using Gantt charts like this for time management or, you um, you know, overall deliverables is a really good idea. But just a caveat, you'll probably not stay with your timeline that you first create. It's, it's again, it's gonna be a moving target. You'll likely fall behind and it's okay, just move the squares, but at least it'll help you keep track of your tasks, how long it takes, um, why did it take so long so that you can be accountable to your committee members um, and, and things like that. But, you know, be familiar with, with organized, um, like outlook on how your time is managed. Um, so this is kind of like your project management timeline, right? But what about time management on like a daily scale? I say start using Google Calendar or some other type of calendar that you, um, if you haven't started using it yet, and then start actually scheduling sessions into your calendar. Uh, my calendar actually looks crazy like this and it's it's bad because it gives me anxiety, but um, you can actually, you know, make it different colors and you can toggle it on and off. You could put time in to read your papers. You could, you know, put time to ex do explorations in the lab. Um, I highly recommend, especially now in the time of Zoom, um, co-working sessions with people so that you actually work on something together. Like let's say your prospectus or, or your thesis proposal. Um, you can even schedule in breaks, workout time, um, block out certain blocks where you just need personal time so that you don't schedule something else into there. 
so that you can actually schedule in your mental health time. So use this as um, an advantage for yourself, you know? Um, and also, you know, if, if someone needs to schedule meetings with you, you can easily um, share this calendar and it's very organized as well. And then this is really, really important. Just start writing, write phrases, sentences, non-sentences, whatever thoughts, you know, stream of consciousness, just write whatever it is. Um, right now in the beginning when you don't know what your research project is, maybe it's about, you know, what kind of research you want to do. Um, you heard about um, some really cool um, paper or, you know, some professor and what research they did, just write, start writing things down because you'll surprise yourself when you actually have to turn in your prospectus, you know, and then you're like, whoa, I wrote this much down. That's great, you know? So just start writing because that's gonna be your biggest nemesis. Okay, so I wanna take a QA and a break. Um, the second half is going to be more about um, time management and personal um, work-life balance, but um, maybe we can take a short Q&A break. I know that someone had entered a question earlier about tutoring resources. So we know that as far as writing, there are some excellent resources available uh, to students. The Writing Center, which is through the English department, offers one-on-one -on -one consultations for both academic and non-academic writing pieces. So I'll go ahead and put the link for the Writing Center in there if you're interested in help for that. Uh, they'll reopen in September uh, for appointments. Let's see, someone's asking, what was the project timeline program called? So how do you, uh, the, oh, I think um, we were talking about Gantt. Yeah, when it, when it looks like a Gantt chart, you know, I actually just use Excel or Google Sheets. Um, that's probably the easiest because then you can keep it in your Google Drive. But there might be some fancier actual project timelines that actually connect to your calendar and then um, you can <laughs> have reminders and things like that. Here's a good question. Someone's asking, is there such a thing as too much communication between students and their advisor or faculty? Um, no, I think, well, maybe, depends. This really depends on your advisor style and your lab style, because some advisors really like to do um, weekly check-ins. And you know, some advisors really thrive on maybe texts on Slack or personal text or you know, things like that. I mean, maybe some advisors can't. You know, they, they actually say, I will only answer questions on Slack because my email just gets buried. So I think you know, there's not a one answer to that question. Um, you, you need to figure that out and with your advisor. And maybe the best way to figure that out is to talk to people in the lab. If there's existing graduate students or existing um, postdocs, technicians in the laboratory yeah or or group you know your your graduate student group sorry i keep saying lab because i come from a science background but i know that there are other disciplines out there okay uh, let's just take one more question uh because it's somewhat related to the one we just asked how do you reach out to potential mentors when you feel like you have nothing to give in return yeah that's a really good question um I mean, I know I, I want to say immediately, like, don't think that way. Don't think that you don't have anything to give in return because, but, you know, I know that, that like you are having, you know, doubts and anxiety about starting grad school. And, and that's why the, the question was phrased that way. Um, but seriously, everyone in academia and everybody at school is going to want to help you. And if they don't, then that's their loss. So I, you know, I really welcome actually, you know, random people saying like, hey, I'm in high school and I really want to talk to you even for 15 minutes, you know, and I, I, I'm not, you know, especially nice, I don't think. Like I know other professors who are like really willing to help um, their mentees and, and willing to, you know, acquire mentees because that's why we're all in academia. Like otherwise we're, we wouldn't be in this position. Thank you. Okay, so we're gonna shift back to the presentation, but we will have more time for questions. Really quickly, I'll make a plug 
for one of our sessions on Thursday, which is building an effective relationship with your mentor. So that'll be with Dr. Grove and he'll have some other tips and advice on this topic as well. Dr. Rii, if you wanna continue. Yeah, um, actually we'll launch um, straight into another poll. Um, we're gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about work-life balance during graduate school. So I wanna see how good you guys are at already maintaining work-life balance. The majority of people have responded. We're gonna go ahead and close the poll and share results. Yeah, all right. So most of you answered, 50% answered, I have phases when I'm good at balance. So that's really good actually. Um, only 8% said I am terrible. <laughs> I can't find any time for other things. And I try to take breaks. Um, so, this, I started with this poll to really get you guys thinking about you, how your work-life balance is right now, because as you enter graduate school, um, it's really, really important. Um, because if your mental health is not good, if your, you know, your work-life balance is not good, then it's gonna affect your work. So step two in graduate school, you're going to grow a lot. Um, maybe some of you will only be here for, for a couple years, two to three years for your master's, you know, maybe um, much longer for your PhD, but you're going to grow, you're going to make mistakes and learn, right? So the ultimate goal is to graduate, but it's really important to know how you want to grow during graduate school. So be ready for the unexpected and for experiencing new places, viewpoints, and new people. Um, you need to be um, adaptable, but you're going to figure out who you are. A lot of people in graduate school um, become, you know, parents or become uh, married or, you know, like they have to start taking care of aging parents or, or like a lot of different life changes start happening in graduate school. So figure out who you are and what's important to you while you're in graduate school and we'll get what you came for. Um, again, you know, I mentioned this from the beginning, your graduate career will not go from A to B to C. You're probably not going to be very straightforward and everyone's going to be different. So along the way, use this time to find your passion and do what makes you happy. Um, you know, ultimately there are all sorts of paths and lives and you, you have to live out your own dreams. So, you know, when you finish your thesis, you don't want to feel like, okay, like, where do I go now? I mean, which is what happens very often. But in the meantime, if you, if you find your, or if you try to find people that really speak your language and do the things that you like to do and find your passion, then and think of it as a, this training to become the whole person that you are, not just your thesis. So in order to do this, a lots of lots of growing and creating your goals and et cetera, Number one thing is to take care of the basics. Minimize your stresses and identify triggers for anxiety and, and mental health um, immediately. This is, this is really, really important. You guys are starting out, maybe, maybe some of you are moving here or some of you are moving houses to start grad school. So, you know, living situations, take care of that immediately. Have a good home, have a good transportation. Um, you know, parking is difficult in, in, at UH Manoa. Think about how you're gonna commute. Um, Maybe this is okay now because a lot of people are working from home still, you know, and, but then you need a good work environment for your computer for it to be able to work, right? Um, figure out your finances. So, you know, maybe some of you will need another job, you know, um, maybe you need to figure out how to do your taxes. I think I saw some questions in there. Um, if you need a, a assistantship, TA, GA, figure out funding, ask for help through grad division or your mentors or your actual department, figure out scholarships and financial aid. Um, this is really important because if you are struggling with finances and, you know, you need to have different jobs to, to you know, to take care, you know, just to, just to survive, then it's going to affect your work. Um, you know, even things like food, right? Figure out which grocery stores, farmers markets, you know, perhaps even grow your own food, you know, things like that. Like figure out what's going to make your basic life comfortable. Um, health, of course, get health insurance. If you have um, some of those grad graduate schools, um, if you're not a GA or a TA, then you're going to have to get your own health insurance, maybe figure it out. It's, it's really tough world out there right now with the pandemic. So, you know, um, seek help if you haven't got this already. Um, this is a, um, a Q&A that was part of this, um, this 
uh, how you got in, how to survive graduate school. So if you want to check it out, it was saikamohana.wordpress.com. This is a few years old, but basically I asked several um, graduate students in Seoul West, um, how, how do you survive grad school? And many people will balance having friends and hobbies. Grad school is a marathon, not a sprint. So, you know, don't treat it like an undergrad. You just, or you need, just need to pass the classes. Um, and this, you know, there's imposter syndrome that people talk about. Um, I know that Kristen and um, NGSO are probably going to offer something else on imposter syndrome, but it is real where you feel like you don't belong somewhere, whether it's because you don't feel like you know the material or you feel like you don't belong for other reasons. So, you know, be kind to yourself, have compassion, take the breaks you need, you know, seek mentors again, seek support. Um, really, really important to have mental health during this time. And then, of course, be adaptable. I can't stress this enough. I, I put this picture up. This is actually a restoration site that um, I work out in Heia in the Windward Oahu. And this is actually um, our landscape that used to be all taro fields. And you know, it was inundated with invasive species like mangrove. But then as we cut them down, we see water finding its pathway towards the ocean, right? So that to me, I feel like, you know, be like water, right? Be adaptable and flexible. Um, find your way um, in, in ways that, um, that will help you and that, that you want. Um, okay, so right now, maybe your life, life bubble is, you know, pretty good size. Maybe it's pretty even to work, work. but as you start grad school, it's going to become like this. You know, this is, this is how it becomes, where the work bubble starts getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But I want you guys to remember, if you take away anything from this talk, that this shouldn't look like this. It should look more like this, or even the work should be, you know, like it, life should definitely be bigger. Nowadays, um, non-traditional students are all students. There's no such thing as non-traditional students. Everyone has something. Everyone's on edge because of the pandemic. There's something that you are going through, right? So do all these things and don't be apologetic for it. Be open-minded to others who are going through things. Don't judge. Um, and normalize family and a life. Like, you know, for me, I have two kids home right now because they were exposed to COVID this morning and I'm gonna have them home for the week. So, you know, you, you just have to adapt and normalize it in your work life. Um, you'll be working a lot of hours. Um, it's not like some other jobs where you can leave work at work. In academia, you actually bring work home and you're gonna wake up at 2 a.m. to do work, right? So. It's just really, really important that um, you carve out time for yourself and your life on nights or weekends or whenever is convenient for you. So that work blends in with life. And if this does become too much and overwhelming, there are resources at UH Manoa. Um, for those of you who are parents, um, student parents at Manoa, there is um, Title IX, there's counseling and student development centers, financial aid and et cetera. Um, you know, there, there are resources out there. I don't know of all of them, but um, talk to people. I'm sure Kristen can point you out to um, on some of them, but seek out resources and, and you know, you'll, you'll, hopefully you can find some, some assistance or some help. Okay, so um, this is, I think my last poll and I'll, I'll end on the last stretch. Okay, great. Wow, okay, most people have responded. I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll and share the results. Okay, great. Oh, this is so great. You guys, uh, about 69% total <laughs> have a five-year plan or know what they want to do after graduate school, which is really actually incredible. Um, so that's really great. So I wanna go back to what I said about graduate, graduate school being kind of like a job right? You are getting training. So think about setting up towards a future job. So many of you just remember to be professional during your graduate school. I know we're in Hawaii. Um, things are a lot more casual here, but think about communication etiquette. You know, even during emails, um, answer emails promptly. You know, I would say like a week, you know, is a good communication etiquette, you know, to respond properly. Um, use professional language and emails appropriately, not texting language, you know, like you spell it out, you um, dress appropriately when you actually do show up in person. Um, you know, most people, it is like, you know, t-shirts, shorts, slipper kind of place, but, you know, maybe, maybe think about what's on your t-shirt, you know, and, 
and try to look professional because if you want it to be treated as an emerging professional, then, you know, don't dress like a student, right? Like you think of yourself as an emerging professional and then show reciprocity, right? Like, you know, of course, like don't spend money and stuff like that, but think about, you know, like if you met with someone and they really extended some kindness towards you, write a thank you note, you know, I sometimes like bake cookies or something when I go to a meeting and, and things like that. So, so think about how you might want to be treated and, and little gestures that, you know, bring kindness and, and, sh and at the same time show professionality. Um, but like I said before about IDPs, individual development plans, um, build your CV. So always network. Every meeting is a, a chance for um, networking. Take opportunities, like even a volunteer or, you know, helping someone out, you know, going with someone like your lab mate or your group mate, you know, to something, you know, you might make connections um, that, that might pan out in the future. If you meet someone that you really are, you really think are fascinating, um, I think this goes back to your question. Somebody asked about how do you seek out mentors, you know, um, seek out informational interviews. Just don't be afraid to say, hey, can I pick your brain? This is my passion. And you know, can I, can I actually ask you how you got here? Um, and then reach out, you know, in graduate school, I think it's really common to do your research and then just kind of stay within your discipline, but communicate early during and end of your research project, you know, give talks or teach, um, practice, you know, go out in the classroom, go out in the public, you know, um, it'll give you different perspectives and it'll actually help you uh, develop your CV. Okay, so I think I'm going to skip this Q&A break and then just go into my last and then we can do a big Q&A um, at the end, if that's okay. So final step for graduate school, but most important, I just want to talk a little bit about being present in Hawaii. And I started out, you know, this talk about with a land acknowledgement and, you know, with an olelo noeau because um, Hawaii is a really unique place. And if you are local and you're attending graduate school, you may already know it. Um, you know, Hawaii is a special place, it's your home. Um, but if you have just arrived, um, you guys probably know this already too. Being in school is gonna thrust you into a different uncomfortable space maybe of, you know, different demographics, different people, different beliefs, um, but approach with humility and compassion. So what I wanna say is, you know, it, it would be really important to be present um, and seek out understanding of the history of this place, why people act the way they do or why people have the mindsets that they do and think about marginalized communities and how you can be part of the solution of moving towards equity. So many of you may be doing research in you know, different disciplines, but um, I just wanna talk about how you know, Native Hawaiians participated where humans were a key partnership in maintaining abundance, right? In, in every depiction of Native Hawaiians, they were part of the landscape. So for us to succeed as you know, a, a number one research institution in UH Manoa, we need to engage in this culture of reciprocity. So I want to, you to think about what type of researcher or what type of academic do you want to be? And, and think about these concepts of reciprocal collaboration. Um, there is a um, researcher and community um, um, standards called Kulana no Ii that's available through Sea Grant. That's source.hawaii.edu. But think about conducting, you know, um, and co conducting culturally appropriate research and co-developing research and, and the ramifications of your research on place and people, and collaboratively producing new knowledge. And this is really, really important because UH Manoa is a native Hawaiian place of learning. And you can check out more details about this, but you know, how can you participate in UH Manoa as a native Hawaiian place of learning in the various disciplines that you guys all represent? And then just lastly, the UH Manoa diversity profile. And um, I showed this last year, um, I think it's just really important to be aware and to have these conversations. You know, many of you will be working with local students in the local community where the demographics have a lot of, um, you know, non, non Caucasian students in uh, that, that make up a large proportion of the diversity profile. But as you move towards graduate students and then even the faculty, many are, um, the majority are, are Caucasian. And so, you know, this is not me being, you know, trying not to be on a, on a soapbox, but just reality is that there are, you know, 
University of Hawaii is making immense strides towards equity and diversity. There are a lot of diversity efforts in every department right now. And, you know, so educate yourself and, and find out what you want to stand up for, who you want to be a part of, right? And what communities you want to be a part of. So be part of that, of that movement. And then finally, going back to um, being in Hawaii in a unique place, Laulima means many, many hands. That's how you move this life, you know, forward, right? And if you are have anxiety about graduate school, this is how you're gonna get through um, work-life balance as well as people. Um, Aloha Aina, taking care of your land, taking care of yourself, taking care of this, this environment everywhere. So get involved with the community that will help you mind and soul. Um, I can't stress that enough. You know, graduate school isn't just about like doing your research and, and being holed up in the library or lab or et cetera. So get out there and, and fulfill other people's lives as well as yours. Okay, so I will get off my soapbox now. And thank you guys for listening and I'll take questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Rii. We really appreciate all the ideas and advice that you shared with us today. So we'd like to open it up to questions and answers again. Uh, please feel free to submit that through the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, we'll try to get to as many questions as possible in the time allotted, uh, but please feel free to email us at gdevents at hawaii.edu if you still have a pressing question or, or reach out uh, to the contact information you see on this presentation. Okay, so one question we have is about the uh, decision making process for research topics. Is that something that students are expected to come up with on their own or is that a collaborative process between the student and faculty advisor? How does that work? Yeah, I think it really depends. Um, if you're coming into um, a project, um, it really depends on funding too. So let's say you're waiting for maybe um, a grant that your advisor submitted and there was a project in there, you know, they said, oh, you know, we can support you on this grant. Um, maybe there's an, an outline of a project, but I think it's, it's really expected that you can come up with some, you know, original ideas or nuggets. So that's where, you know, how do you even come up with original ideas, right? That really comes from knowing what has already been studied. That's why literature review and bibliography is really, really important. Um, whether it's a, a committee thing, um, don't, don't feel like you have to come up with it all on your own. I mean, obviously talk to other people in your field, talk to your advisors, talk to your, you know, if you have a committee members already. I think many grad divisions, I mean, departments come up with like a, um, like a, you know, initial committee that may not be your um, actual thesis committee that will help you with um, classes and, and making sure you're on track. So you can, you can consult with them as well. Thank you. And related to that, is there a recommended time frame by when you should have identified your research topic? So for example, if you're uh, PhD and, and you're in a five-year program, by second year, third year, <laughs> any suggestions? You know, I think the general topic maybe should be solidified within the first, you know, two to three years, you know, but maybe by the time that depends on your um, your actual um, department rules, but many divisions, you know, require you to turn in a prospectus to move forward with your, you know, let's say your PhD, and then you have to take your qualifying exams, right? But a lot of times, you know, your prospectus or whatever your thesis proposal is, is like a living document. So, you know, you, you propose something, and then you start actually doing the research, and then you might have to change it. So what you write as a proposal is not set in stone. You know, I, I think of it as like that living document is eventually going to become your written thesis. So you should have like a, a general idea with maybe, you know, one chapter really good by the end of your second year, maybe, you know, first year is great, you know, but I, you know, first year you're probably taking classes and not and absorbing everything. Thank you. Uh, next, next question is, do you have any recommendations about how to network with organizations in the community while you're in your graduate program? Um, yeah, what, what kind of organizations are you, are you thinking about organizations that um, will get you like you're thinking of having a career with or someone that some organization that will help, um, you know, your career um, or, or your thesis? 
Um, either way, I think um, if there are local organizations, you know, going to conferences like um, that are local, locally based, or going to meetings, like maybe ask your advisor, you know, can you connect me? I mean, basically in Hawaii, it's all about who knows who <laughs> too. It's a really small community. So someone is bound to know the, the community. So, you know, get some sort of introduction um, and then network with them that way. Uh, oh, I see. For my program specifically, master's in public administration. Careers, yeah. Um, you know, I think for certain things like community service, you could probably cold email, you know, and network because a lot of times, um, I think thanks, thanks to COVID, the, like a lot of organizations have really active Instagram and Facebook, you know, because they, they're looking for community service. Um, but otherwise, I would say, yeah, seek out connections through different groups and, you know, people you know. Thank you. So we're, we're running out of time here. I'll just kind of close up. We did have a question about um, how to overcome imposter syndrome that was mentioned earlier. Uh, we did a panel on this last spring, which Dr. Ree was gracious enough to uh, participate in as well. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna post in the chat box if anyone's interested. We record a number of our graduate division professional development uh, webinars that we host. And we did record the imposter syndrome panel. So if you are interested, you can click that link and watch any of our videos or just the imposter syndrome panel. Uh, and hopefully you'll, you'll find some um, value in those sessions. We will send emails out throughout the semester on our different events that we hold through graduate division. I know we had some questions about EndNote and Zotero. So we have a Zotero workshop as part of orientation on August 16th. We will have an EndNote workshop with the library on September 2nd as well. So check your emails for that. Uh, I know that some people were interested in learning about the campus resources that Dr. Rie had mentioned as well. So I just posted the link for our selected campus resources for graduate students in the chat box for that. Um, but it looks like we did get to all the questions today. Thank you very much. Uh, please take care, as Dr. Rie said, um, find balance uh, in, in your graduate student experience. And we do look forward to seeing you throughout the week. This concludes our session for today. <laughs>